So as we move into the final paper of today, we have Sandra Kemp. And Sandra has been director of the Ruskin Library, Museum and Research Centre at Lancaster University for just over two years now. And she has transformed it. She's also visiting professor at Imperial College London. As an academic and a curator, she has previously worked at the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Royal College of Art, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, and the Universities of Oxford, Edinburgh, and Glasgow. Her publications and exhibitions range widely. Most recent is this year's exhibition, Ruskin Museum of the Near Future, and you're going to be hearing a bit about that shortly. As well as John Lockwood Kipling, Art, Design and Industry, a research collaboration between the V&A, the Bard Graduate Center in New York, and the Lahore Museum in Pakistan, and an exhibition at the V&A in London, all tied together in a project. She is currently leading an international research partnership funded by the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council entitled Universal Histories and Universal Museums on the role of the museum in building knowledge about the future. And so I welcome Sandra Kemp on Ruskin Museum of the Near Future. And thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Jim, for asking me to talk. It's a great pleasure to be here today. I'm really sorry that you're not hearing Clive Wilmer, though the good news is that um, Clive, who gave his last um, talk at the annual meeting of the Guild of St. George, that talk will be published, and it's a quite wonderful talk, so you can still get Clive um, as well. Um, in standing in, Jim asked if I'd talk about Lancaster University's Ruskin White House collection, um, both about the collection itself and our plans for its future, the next planned stage of its development, and in terms of the conference, Ruskin's enduring legacy in this context. For those of you who don't know, this is the Ruskin building, um, the collection is an unparalleled gathering of works by Ruskin and his circle, formed by his contemporary, the educationalist and liberal MP, John Howard Whitehouse. The collection's been on loan to Lancaster University for a quarter of a century, and with the help of the National Lottery and 11 other funders, we raised the millions of pounds necessary to acquire it over the last year. In this... <laughs> wonderful, of course, that that could happen in this Ruskin's bicentenary year. This means, importantly, and I want to walk you through the journey of trying to buy this collection today and trying to develop strong arguments to multiple funders, this means that the collection can never be split up and never sold. It's been bought in perpetuity for the nation. Um, in my role at the V&A, at least for the last five years, I don't know those of you who may have visited over that period, was to think about what was for a long time a giant hole in the road, which was our first new building, our new exhibition space, since the museum was built as the South Kensington Museum in 1857. And the projects I've been working on, really for a decade, have been to work with museums across Europe that were founded in the 19th century, mostly 18th or 19th century, to ask what the future of these amazing historic collections should be, what they mean for the future. So coming to the Ruskin collection, that was one of the tasks that the university asked me to work on. So I wanted to uh, launch into a sort of little vignette of the future, because unless we're thinking about what I might call Stanley Kubrick white cube futures, or one theorist of the future called the indefatigable gee whiz of the future, it's actually quite hard to think about the future. So I want to get you into a future headspace. Now... In our collection, 
and here are some of them. These are Ruskin's daguerreotypes. They're some of the early, they date from the 1850s. They're some of the earliest known images of Venice and the Alps in the world. To put this in context, the v &A has two from the same period of London. And just to be Trump-like about this for the moment, we have 132. <laughs> um, now, the daguerreotype in Ruskin's time was a new technology invented in 1839 and widely used in the 1840s and 1850s. Uh, a daguerreotype created early photographic images by channeling sunlight through a camera obscura onto a silver-plated copper plate, a silver-coated copper plate. Seeing a really early daguerreotype photograph by Daguerre in Venice in 1845, Ruskin wrote to his father, it's very nearly the same thing, he said, as carrying off the palace itself. Every chip and stone and stain is there. Interestingly, and somebody earlier mentioned uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Ruskin, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, um, of a daguerreotype now in the National Portrait Gallery in London, was mesmerized but also chilled by it. She said, it's like the very shadow, it's a, of a person, a portrait daguerreotype, it's like the very shadow of the person lying there forever. I don't think it's very hard to overestimate how new these technologies were. For Ruskin, the daguerreotype was astounding because it could reveal details not visible to the naked eye. The following year, in Venice still, he proclaimed it the most marvelous invention of the century. But Ruskin, of course, and as you're probably getting the picture today, wasn't content to use this technology for the purpose of mere reproduction. He said, my attention was wholly fixed on the possibility of painting with sunlight. And when, along with Howard, um, director and curator at Brantwood, we created the launch exhibition, having purchased the collection, one of the titles, one of the possible titles for that show, not Museum of the Near Future, but would have been Painting with Sunlight. For him, this was nothing less than a bold challenge to science. No chemist, he said, has yet succeeded in doing this. Staying with futures and staying with the daguerreotype for the moment, just a few years after Ruskin, at a joint meeting of the Academy of Arts and Sciences in Paris, Francois Arago, who was director of the Paris Observatory, also described the extraordinary potential of the daguerreotype. He said, remember this is 1850s, I am amazed that we can now potentially record images of galaxies millions of light years distant and reveal one day the origins of life by bringing to our view infinitesimally small life forms. This is a moving experience of a nature beyond normal perception in an experience of extreme visual intimacy. In struggling to find words uh, to describe the daguerreotype, he quoted the philosopher, mathematician, scientist, and historian Leibniz. Leibniz. And this is, or could be, um, an epigraph for my lecture. The present is replete with the future and filled with the meaning of the past. This could also be a description of our collection and of a, a worldview of Ruskin. So, our collection. Here is the Ruskin. It's a library, a museum, and a research center. And this was it as I left to come to Los Angeles, uh, just as it was getting dark. The building itself could be the subject of a lecture on its own. It's structured, it's an award-winning building by the architect McCormack, and it's a metaphor of Ruskin's relationship with some of the key themes and loves of his life, with Venice, 
The building contains every material in which Ruskin worked. And here, in a daytime picture of the front, or the, the, it's actually the back of the building, but it's the first bit you approach, on the edge of the building is slake from Coniston Water, where, as you've heard, Ruskin spent a large part of the last part of his life. So, the collection itself. Um, in addition to the daguerreotypes, so I just want to walk you through for a moment um, the collection. The um, collection contains more than 1,500 drawings, paintings, and about 500 prints by Ruskin. Beautiful, beautiful drawings and sketches. And as you'll see, the themes are the themes that have been coming up again and again today. Um, I've um, relentlessly collaged them so you can see as many as possible. Um, architectural details, animals. These are shows with our work. Uh, our collection contains not just works by Ruskin, but works by his circle as well. And then something which interests me um, greatly, and which is going to be the subject of another of our exhibitions, which the Royal Society has just given us sponsorship for. I'm absolutely fascinated by Ruskin's scientific drawings. Much work has been done on Ruskin's drawings, but I think to contextualise the skill of his scientific drawings uh, within scientific drawing of the 19th century would be really extraordinary. Um, drawings that, like this one at the bottom, we had a professor of um, computer science visit the launch exhibition the other day, and he said, Does Rus did Ruskin know about fractals? I mean, the extraordinary... And as you will see, not just the precision, but often the humour of the drawings um, comes through. These are the drawings that we used as um, our theme and lead drawing for the launch exhibition, almost H.G. Wellian um, images of a future, but actually scientifically for Ruskin, pictures of the curvilinear and rectilinear of the clouds. In the launch exhibition, we tried to show every media in which Ruskin worked. I'm going to come on to that in a moment, but um, we show the models as well as his drawings of feathers. Um, so along with the drawings and paintings, we have 29 volumes of Ruskin's diaries. And when I get bored or fed up, or both, that's the archive I go to. And I've been working my way through the diaries, and in the launch show again, was very keen to show these beautiful, beautiful geological drawings, which... Um, uh, are throughout the diaries almost as much as his drawings of clouds. Um, we have 7,400-ish letters, um, and this includes correspondence with Turner, Darwin, Carlyle, Palmerton, Octavia Hill, and others. We have many books from Ruskin's own library, and we've been hearing about marginalia, and there are some very fascinating um, annotations in those. And then we have, which is the other big exhibition that I've been talking with Tate about, which is doing an exhibition. We have 44 of uh, Ruskin's incredibly special uh, lecture diagrams. To give you um, a sense of the scale of these, so this is, these are four. Um, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of the show. So here are the lecture diagrams in the show. Um, if you imagine, he choreographed these on stage in Oxford as Slade Professor to massively large audiences. And again, I'm going to come back to these. Some of the lecture diagrams are um, 
rolled up in our archive and haven't been unrolled since the 1870s when Ruskin gave them as lectures. So um, actually, as a um, brought along, uh, left on the front desk, our launch, pu launch publication, and you can see more about the lecture diagrams and our quest to restore those and research them uh, for the future. Um, as you will have seen from this um, image of the exhibition, one of the things that's extraordinary about our collection is the dazzling uh, shifts from micro to macro, as well as the dazzling um, material universe that the drawings and letters and diaries um, portray. And this lovely quotation here, I see everything far and near, down to the blue lines on this paper and up to the slow night, snow lines on the old man, is something that's very um, fascinating to trace through the resonances across media in the collection. So, um, in thinking about this extraordinary resource and how I was going to persuade funders to combine together to give us the millions to fund it, I made three arguments, and these were they. I'm very happy to have more, by the way, but um, this is what did it for the moment, anyway. This collection, obviously, reveals the voice and vision of one of the eras of the 19th century's most perceptive and ardent writers and artists. And we've heard from Emma's paper just now, but across the day, how important his writings were to, or are to the history of art and architecture. They prefigure modern conservation practice, environmental science, some aspects of material science as well. Secondly, the collections offer what you might call a 360 view of the origins of Ruskin's thinking and his, his reception, the reception of his thinking. And they affirm his role, and again, we've been hearing in different ways about that today, as a catalyst of innovation in social, political, and environmental practices. You could say, and we've been hearing a lot about his life, and I want to play devil's advocate and talk about the collection as his works for a moment, the collections document almost an entire century of British cultural, economic, and social history and afford unique insights into the foundations of artistic, social, scientific, and political developments, these developments that have helped define modern cultural movements, the formation of social, political, and environmental thinking and policy, and organizations that have continued to shape and define culture since Ruskin's death nearly 120 years ago. Most importantly of all, perhaps, and I can tell you that certainly for our National Lottery Fund, this was the argument that won the day. As I'm sure is the case here for competing for funding, there were many comparable um, collections that the lottery was potentially considering funding, and it wasn't looking too good for us. So I said to the fund manager I'd been working with, what can I do? And she said, well, you could, we really, really support you. We really, really don't want this collection brought up. So what you could do is we could allow you to sort of cheat and show it to the trustees on the day of the meeting. Without, um, <laughs> without going into detail, this required a journey Ruskin has never taken before in an enterprise rent -a van down the M6 of a Sunday morning. Um, but actually, what won the day for the trustees, I think, was to see the same idea in a sketch, in a notebook, in a diary, in a letter to his cousin Joan, in, um, in a finished drawing, and in perhaps a painting. 
and to cross-read across those different media, which if the collections were split and all of those things were in different places, you would never be able to do. So most importantly of all, perhaps, the collections demonstrate the assembly and presentation of knowledge as integrally interconnected and, in Ruskin's terms, as an openly available resource, intellectual resource, for all. Ruskin, as you've seen in all of the presentations, I think, today, conveyed his insights through a blend of images and words, cutting across science, religion, art, literature, economics, and social sciences. Ruskin's work combine plural repertoires of knowledge and the interplay, and I think this is incredibly relevant and topical, the interplay of scientific knowledge and social and cultural values. Not C.P. Snow's two cultures, science over there and Luddite artists over here, but the interplay of cultural, aesthetic and social with scientific. Um, you could argue as well, I tried this anyway with the HLF, that Ruskin hyperlinked his on-site documentation, measurement, photography, drawing, and verbal de depiction in a way that would be entirely familiar in a digital age, but was new and avant-garde for his time. He hyperlinked these with reflective texts and regularly cross-referenced this work in public and private letters. And it's that hyperlinking that makes our, our, connection, our collection so rich and so unique. So here you have the first wall of our exhibition, and you can see that we're able to show the manuscripts and the letters at the bottom and the series going up and through to a number of finished pieces. So what of the future then? We saved the day. We own the collection. What next? So the first thing we did was held the university to ransom and said, now you've bought it, you've had this building for 25 years, we need to bring the building up to speed to merit the collection. So we literally wrapped the building up and spent a lot of money, a lot of university money, upgrading it. So we cleaned the outside, which is incredibly important because it has a very sophisticated air control archive, air control system, and we upgraded the galleries digitally so we can work across a range of media. Um, we also asked ourselves on campus a question that had been asked by Robert Hewison and some of the um, scholars we've been hearing about who were responsible over the last 25 years for putting Ruskin back on the map. We asked a question that had been asked 25 years ago, and here were some of the answers 25 years ago. What's the point of Ruskin today? But we also asked ourselves the question, what's the point of Ruskin on a university campus? And I rather love this photograph, I'm afraid because we're nearly in the Lake District, it always rains, so it's very hard to get nice blue skies on the Ruskin Library. But this was the first day of term, and this was students taking over the area outside the Ruskin and our sign directing people to the exhibition. And, and we really have been asking ourselves, not just what's the point of a collection of Ruskin, but what's the point of this collection of Ruskin on campus. And that's why we thought we would invite people to re-look at the collection. There have been wonderful, wonderful exhibitions over the last 25 years. And the last 25 years have been an extraordinary project run by a group of scholars inside Lancaster, but also many of the people in the room today and across Europe to explore this collection, to catalogue it, to loan it extensively so the collection is shown and has been shown across the world. So the next question is, well, what next? How can we bring 
different things, more people to this collection. Um, when I had to engage in the task of um, buying the collection, the collection had to be valued, which gave me the excuse to spend a lot of time in the archive ascending evaluation, assembling a valuation document. I reckon that even after 25 years, it's roughly about a third of the collection that sees the light of day regularly, and two-thirds of the collection is nearly at the point where people in the past have felt confident to say, this image is of this place at this time, but they're not quite sure. And a, a large part of the other two-thirds is a bit like the lecture diagram. The, the wonderful thing is we still need to conserve, identify, and work on it. Um, so what we decided to do was launch this exhibition, and it was a very, very interesting challenge, Howard and I discovered, because by the time we got, had actually saved the collection, most of the collection was out on loan across the world for the bicentenary year. So we asked ourselves, how do we curate a launch exhibition to say this is the most fantastic collection and we've saved it for Lancaster, when you have essentially to work with these so-called dregs of the collection? Of course, this wasn't true, this being Ruskin. We discovered that we could profile works like the lecture diagrams, and our commitment in this launch exhibition was to explore how Ruskin's ideas speak powerfully to our own era, inviting us to look closely, see clearly, and imagine freely in order to build a better future for all, which was, of course, Ruskin's mission. Now, I think we should probably, in this conference, start playing a kind of party game that when a speaker says something that's already been said four times before, if it's nearly Christmas, perhaps you should all boo. But anyway, um, I'm going to do it, I'm afraid, um, because the exhibition was built around the, you can now all rehearse after me, famous quotation, there is no wealth but life. So we thought we would take Ruskin on his own terms, and the exhibition is about, from the very basic building blocks of life, exploring Ruskin's answers to those questions across art, across material science, across environmental science, and something that hasn't been mentioned perhaps yet today, hooray, something new for me to say, um, through the eyes of practicing artists. So in the exhibition, the exhibition contains a number of fantastic works by contemporary artists in response uh, to Ruskin. And in the, in the catalogue for the exhibition, cunningly, this is like Blue Peter, here's one I made earlier, um, cunningly concealed inside, you'll find quotations from the contemporary artists explaining how and why they responded to Ruskin. So the exhibition shows Ruskin moving through Ruskin's own lifelong quest to help others or show others or encourage others to experience the world as acutely as he did, embracing life in all its forms through closely observed studies, depicting everything from the filament of a thistle or barb of a peacock's feather to the branch of a tree or a bird's wing. Above all, the exhibition explores how Ruskin demonstrated the ways in which we see things now will form the way we think and behave in the future. Ruskin understood how the future is embedded in the here and now, and as, as Jim said and showed earlier, the lovely logo of his motto today affirms how profoundly he was aware of how the, le the lives we lead in the present, set the conditions of the world to come. Above all, and we've had Ruskin's own word several times today, unhumanizing or dehumanizing, Ruskin was deeply concerned with the dehumanizing effects of technology, the impact of industrialization on the health of the planet in a way that speaks, of course, powerfully to our own era. So, the exhibition looks across the arts and sciences 
to um, demonstrate, and it was Diana's word, the connectedness or interconnectedness of Ruskin's thinking across word and image. And the voice of the exhibition, the exhibition narrative, is Ruskin's. So from, you can see the back of the lecture diagram here, the narrative voice of the exhibition is a series of quotations from Ruskin. But Howard and I thought another layer on this would be to ask our visitors a series of questions framed through Ruskin's eyes as they go through the exhibition. We started the exhibition with a wonderful quotation from Ruskin where he says one-sided or two-sided or even three-sided thinking is enough, isn't enough. People should think like a polygon or four-sided thinking is the only way to think. So what is four-sided thinking? Or another question would be, how do you think with your heart? Heart thought is something that Ruskin talks about. My favourite one, how do you paint with light? Um, show you these wonderful drawings. What's the difference between a feather and a cloud? How do buildings grow? Then, do words and images script the future? And where is tomorrow's world today? I think that was a big Ruskin question. Where is tomorrow's world today? And of course... What is life? Now, here we go. You're all allowed to boo now. Um, this is, um, I'm about to quote the Tolstoy quote. Here we go. Um, so we've already heard that Tolstoy thought of Ruskin as a profoundly futures thinking thinker. He was one of those men who thinks what everyone will think and say in the future. And so moving forward, we want the incredibly... Um, meticulous, um, uh, international, because it is international, scholarship that has happened and continues to happen um, in the Ruskin. So at the moment we have three PhD students from the Sorbonne in France, one from India and three from Cambridge working on the material. We've had an international visiting scholar from India working on Ruskin and Gandhi. And we have what we think of as our much-beloved regulars who've come and worked on the collection for years and years and continue to work on it. We need that art historical, uh, architectural and uh, literary work to continue. But we also want to begin to open up the, question, uh, the collections to mobilise the pressing cultural, social and environmental issues of today. The collection offers the basis for using Ruskinian materials, the works, as a springboard for addressing some of these ongoing social, cultural and environmental issues. Recently, um, scientists from the university where I still work at Imperial College, from the Grantham Institute at Imperial College, which is one of the world's foremost research centres um, for climate change, came and looked at Ruskin's daguerreotypes because, of course, they're a fantastic record uh, of climate change in the Alps. Um, just one small example. Um, our desire is to take Ruskin off the dark, dusty library shelves and into the real 21st century landscape of the big questions that are obsessing us all today. So I just wanted to end, but I'm just going to ask Rachel how long I've got, because I'm in my own very lovely jet-lagged time at the moment, so I have no idea what time we're in. Five minutes. So I just wanted to end with the ways, uh, very briefly, that we've been thinking about uh, using the collection uh, to extend in new ways. And broadly speaking... Oh, here we have people looking. Um, this is what we plan to do. We think the collection, and I won't uh, labour this point because it's been made many times today, um, enables us to connect across disciplines. Um, I've worked 
in commissioning contemporary artists when I was at the V&A, actually, one of the people I worked closely with was the architect and filmmaker Liam Young, this beautiful work. Um, at the core, he says, we're interested in the roles of futures and fiction to pose questions, not just to find solutions to problems, but to identify new spaces for operation. And I think that could be a wonderful um, statement about Ruskin and the potential of Ruskin's works as well. That's a Liam Young piece, Tomorrow's World Today. Um, in thinking of the interdisciplinary, in this essay that's already been referred to, Storm Cloud, Ruskin said, I have been able, during all active work, to use my power of contemplative imagination with as easy command of it as a physicist with his telescope. Wonderful fluency um, across disciplines. For Ruskin, images were vibrant shapers of knowledge. The imaginative verve and reach of his thought is stunning. And for Ruskin, as we've seen again and again today, visual depiction was at the heart of inquiry and instruction. And I just um, wanted to pause for one moment over uh, Isabel Stengers, is in my view, a wonderful philosopher and historian of science. And she makes a point that I think, again, is very germane to Ruskin's way of working and thinking. She says, perhaps the most important finding to emerge from the history and sociology of the natural and social sciences over the past decades is that observation is always a form of an intervention. Dinah was talking earlier about ethics as being the kind of skeletal structure that holds together Ruskin's work, and I think that's another way of thinking about this. Secondly, connecting across time. In the exhibition, we show Ruskin's beautiful collection of freshwater shells for which he made these little boxes and labelled them and had a notebook where he recorded them um, meticulously. But he said, and again, it's a very telling quotation, the natural world bears the heavy evidence of our presence in the rhythms and cycles of unfolding time. And we're only just beginning to scratch the surface of the way we think about time and the contemporaneity of time, the dynamic interrelationship of past, present, and future, which is integral to Ruskin's works. Not, we were talking, um, Emma talked about the Lewis quotation, not the chronological, so uh, past and present, but something far more dynamic. Um, it's a jolly tree collection. And in the exhibition um, on loan from Brantwood, we're showing some of uh, Ruskin's amazing geology collection, which of course was integrally the moment that time fractured in the 19th century and new ways of thinking about time and space uh, came about. Um, we've already talked a lot about architecture, but the preservation of the past and the importance of the past in the present was something Ruskin thought profoundly about in that context. And I just wanted to end as a curator with um, uh, something that I think Ruskin was a collector um, and I think one of the things that there's still a lot of work to be done on is Ruskin as a collector. But I also think as a curator, and I've chosen this as my last quotation for a, from a wonderful collection of essays from um, two Canadian scholars um, who basically are defending and writing about research-led exhibitions. Because one of the things we wanted our exhibition to do was to reach an audience way beyond Ruskin scholars. And Butler and Lehrer say, curating may provide the best approach to a given question or issue, a unique mode of address, a form of pedagogy, and a means of social intervention that has particular communicative, visceral, and effective qualities that are both meditative and informative, appealing to
to both our intellect and our emotions. Now, I know it's a long way to come, but I would encourage you all to come and see our launch exhibition <laughs> and try that out full size, because again, I think it, it's a very telling way to end an absolutely true of Ruskin that um, it was Ezra Pound, actually, who said, um, an image is a kind of simultaneousness of thinking and feeling, and that's absolutely true of this amazing collection and of Ruskin's work. So thank you.